Now, if you're going to go and set yourself up a recording studio, there's quite a number of necessities you're going to need right off the meat of the bat. You're going to need a mixing console. You're going to need balanced and unbalanced leads and the associated plugs that go along with them. Obviously, microphones. Footnote, we'll get into them later. You're going to need an amp or amps, depending on how many speakers you're going to run. Preferably power amps that don't add many harmonics to the audio signal. You're going to need uh, some sort of recording device, be that a PC or be it to a rack-mounted HD recorder or mag tape, said to include both analog multi-track and DTRS multi-track. You're going to need patch bays. Footnote, we'll get to them later. You're also going to need effects and dynamics. Returning to our simple tutorial on Pro Audio here at Old Mates Backyard Tech, this one, let's talk about effects and dynamics. Mixing consoles. Monitor and reference speakers. Effects and dynamics. Here at Old Mates Backyard Tech, it's Pro Audio time. G'day everyone, thank you for tuning in, continuing with our simple tutorial on Pro Audio here at Old Mates Backyard Tech for a Monday. And we're talking for this one, effects and dynamics. Now, effects. Well, effects can said to include reverbs and echoes and room sound and all that type of stuff. Dynamics, which can also add effects to the way your audio signal sounds, include compressors, expanders, gates, limiting amps, parametric EQs, graphic EQs, so on and so forth. But initially, we're going to look at a couple or three or four of the most common pieces of dynamics and effects units you're going to need if you want to set yourself up a recording studio. Some of these cross over into the live space as well, but generally not. All right, general. I say generally not because sometimes yes, you can go to a live um, concert or something, and they'll have effects units. Okay, somewhere down the track anyway. But let's let's kick it off with a couple of the most common pieces pieces. Jeez, I'm, maybe I have got Monday artists this morning, guys. A couple of the most common pieces of dynamics equipment you're going to need in a recording studio, and that is a compressor, all right, an audio compressor, and a noise gate. Now, an audio compressor, I've got photos to show you of all of this too. An audio compressor has two functions. It can compress the audio, or it can hard limit the audio. Now, one of my favorite pieces of external dynamics gear is the 1176 Universal Amp, which is both a gentle compressor and a limiter, which is different to that of a standard audio compressor in my mind. Okay, now the opposite to a compressor is an expander. So let's delve into a compressor and then I'll show you a photo. What is an audio compressor? Simply put, real simple here guys, it compresses the higher decibels, brings them down and allows the quieter decibels to come up. So it sort of uh, reduces high signal and increases low signal to bring everything together, okay? And you have a ratio of how much compression you want. You have a threshold of where in the dB range the compressor picks up the signal. You have an attack time, so how quickly do you want the compressor to grab that high signal? How quickly do you want it to release it? And if you're forced into a situation where you're doing, say, 
almost three to one compression, you will have makeup gain on the output to bring that level back up, the overall level back up, all right? That's a compressor in the simplest terminology, okay? Now, if you turn a compressor, if you drive that compressor hard, as I call it, you put the compressor from being a compressor into a limiter, and it basically hard limits, which means everything, for example, will be at minus 2 dB FS if we're working in the digital domain. Or, as I prefer to do, work in the analog signal domain, which is dBVU, the, if you drive the compressor hard enough, you will have everything coming out at minus 2.5 dB VU, for example. So a compressor reduces the high signals and allows the low signals to come up, and you're reducing the high dynamic range of that audio path. That's a compressor. Now, the flip side to a compressor is an expander. So what's an expander? Well, an expander does the opposite to a compressor. An expander reduces the quiet signal and increases the louder signal. Now, I don't use, have I ever used an expander? No, I've actually never had to use an expander. So it works in the opposite direction to that of a um, compressor. An expander will reduce the quieter signal and increase the louder signal. A compressor will reduce the louder signal, allowing the lower signal to come up in overall volume. And there's ratios and everything, all right? So you've got a compressor. Now, I've said this before. Oh, I love this. I've, already, I've been howled on for saying this. Um, and I know MV5, my dear friend, he's exactly the same ilk as me. Okay? When I record something, I record it dry. No channel EQ, no effects, no dynamics. It's whatever goes into the mixer goes to tape. For the digital nutters out there, whatever goes into the mixer goes to the hard drive. Okay, so there's your compressor. There's your, there's your expander, all right? But I, do, I don't use expanders. In fact, I've, I've, I don't even think I've ever used an expander in, in both MIDI or recording. Okay, once that's done, so that's your compressor and your expander. Noise gate, okay? What's a noise gate? Well, a noise gate is like your front gate, okay? Think about it in that analogy. A noise gate lets something through at a specific setting. Okay? Meaning, you set the noise gate to say, allow something to come through when it hits minus 5 dB. Forget about VU or TP or FS. Minus, just say minus 5 dB. So if a signal goes above minus 5 dB, the gate opens. That signal can go through. Once that signal goes below 5 dB, it can't come back in. And if the signal stays below 5 dB, it'll never get back in. Okay? So a noise gate is basically a way of stopping signals coming in that are too low in level. All right? So you might have... You might be recording... Uh, a, a band and in the the way I've recorded in the past is you mic up the instruments and then you add Atmos mics for want of a better term now you may say that you don't want those Atmos mics when you're mixing everything you only want those Atmos mics to come in if 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 say the uh, the drummer goes hard but if the drummer's not going hard you don't want those Atmos mics in the mix Okay, so though you may have those Atmos mics on the noise gate, and it might be just two Atmos mics, left and right, on the noise gate, and you may say to the noise gate, okay, when those Atmos mics come up to minus, 
again, we'll use the minus 5 dB. And it, it, it doesn't matter whether you're talking DBFS or VU. Let's just say minus 5 dB. When those mics come up to, say, minus 5 dB or above, minus 4.5 dB, let that signal through. But once that signal drops below minus 5 dB, don't let it back in. Right, so it's like closing your, your, your front gate. You're only going to let in what you want to let in. Anything else gets blocked out. All right, so that's a noise gate. All right, great if you've also got, say, um, Uh, you you might have instead of having a bass amp, a bass guitar mic'd into the system you, uh, through a DI, you might have it mic. You might have the bass mic'd up, meaning the microphones in front of the bass uh, bass guitar speaker, and that would be where you may use a noise gate with a fairly quick attack and release time or slow attack and release time, take your pick. It depends on how you need it to sound, okay? A lot of this comes into play when you're mixing a track, not necessarily when you're recording, unless you're really in trouble. I've never had to really use a noise gate or an expander or compressor when recording, let alone a mic preamp, but we're not going to talk about mic preamps for the time being. That's a different type. So that's your compressor, your expander, your noise gate. Then you've got your limiting amp, such as my beloved Universal 1176. A limiting amp is both, a, say, a gentle compressor, but a hard limiter as well. And what that'll do is reduce the overall signal. Okay, so you may, say, set the, the maximum output to minus 2 dB. Again, independent of FS or VU or PPM. Minus 2 dB. So nothing gets over it. All right? So they're dynamics. And I'll show you some photos of them shortly. Okay? They're dynamics. Effects. Now, I know I said parametric EQs and that. We're going to talk about EQ in part two because I think this is going to end up being a two-part video on both effects and dynamics. Okay. The next piece of, of our board gear will be your effects system. And there are a myriad of effects units out there. Stacks of them. My personal favourite, the TC Electronics M1. I love that unit because every time, in the times I've recorded, that M1 unit has given me what I want. Now, I got to be on that camera's falling. I'm going to have to fix my webcam. It keeps falling. Hang on, guys. There is something wrong with my webcam. I don't know what's going on, but it keeps falling down. I don't know why, so I apologize. But anyway, effects units. So effects units are echoes, reverbs, the associated gated version, reverse echoes, reverse reverbs, all sorts. As I said, my favorite reverb unit is the TC Electronics M1 because it was one of the ones that had the type of effects I liked to use. Now, as much as I hate mixing, I've done it. It's not my preferred area of pro audio. Um, MV5 and I uh, have very similar interests and different. He loves mixing. And I'll give the guy kudos. He can mix a mean track. I've seen him mix. I prefer recording. And to some extent, mastering. I just don't like mixing. I, I really do not like mixing down. Okay. Um, MV5, on the other hand, loves it. I don't. I love recording. But... The times I have had to mix, I have always found the TC Electronics M1 had the type of reverbs and echoes and all that type of stuff, right? Um, slap echoes. In the digital domain, it would be nice sometimes to have a tape echo, okay? Now, a tape echo would be where you would feed the tape back on itself, okay? Um, a slap echo, so where, you know, it's like, 
that without me blowing the hell out of my... <laughs> without me going over 0 dB VU um, or minus 18 dB FS, which is where I try to keep everything. So um, there's echoes, reverbs, gated reverbs. A gated reverb works as a reverb or gated echo, I should say, is the same as, you know, a noise gate. So... Uh, you'll have the reverb for only as long as you want it rather than it decaying or falling away. Um, reverse echo and reverb, where, which was very common, as we all know, in the 80s. Remember, in the 80s, you know, everything was big sounding, which is what I love. You know, I love that big sound that the 80s used to have. You know, huge drums, huge keys, huge vox, stuff like that. Okay. So you've got noise gate, uh, reverse echoes, spatialing, um, opening up the stereo field I in the final mix, what have you. Okay. Really, really good stuff. Crunchy, e uh, crunchy reverbs and all that type of stuff. All right. So that's effects. And you can throw in mic preamps into that too because some of the mic preamps you buy, and I think Avalon's got one. One of Avalon's mic procs, I think for me, it's either got a, I don't think it's got a 6B6. I think it runs two 12X A7 um, tubes. I, th it, I can't remember the model. The know-it-all experts are going to have an S-fit with me because I also don't know the serial number of the vacuum tubes. You watch, they'll comment and say, how can I not know the serial numbers? One of Avalon's mic preamps, Avalon is a beautiful um, outboard rack company. They make some of the best mic preamps and mic processing equipment on earth, as far as I'm concerned. I came across Avalon in 2002, and they're still going around today. They've been around a long time. But as I said, one of their mic processors uses two 12XA, two, two, 12XA7 valves in it or vacuum tubes wherever you live in the world <coughs> that warms the sound and one thing you've got to remember with digital digital audio is not warm compared to analog audio okay now so effects units expanders noise gates compressors limiting amps all right it's all about effects and dynamics and you often when you walk into a recording studio especially, say, one that's running, you know, a fully-fledged 32-channel, right? And it may have, like, uh, four or eight-track DTRS machines. It may have a full 24-track, two-inch reel-to-reel machine, mag tape. Or it could have two 24-track HDs, hard drive recorders. Now... For you nutters out there, I, I love it when I say hard drive recorders because people think, oh, mechanical. You can buy hard drive recorders with both mechanical and SSD. It's simply a generic term used for a digital outboard hard disk recording platform. Alesis have got a 24 H, a HD24. Doesn't mean it uses hard disk drives. It's called a HD24, hard drive 24 track. Okay, well, we'll get into that at a later date. Anyway, let me show you some pictures now of effects and dynamics so that you guys get a visual understanding of what's what. All right, so first off, let's look at a compressor. All right, this is a pretty typical one. This is the uh, Behringer MDX um 2800 I think it is 2600 okay now I've used a similar model uh, of Behringer I'm not a big Behringer fan but it's actually a reasonably priced compressor and fairly common all right especially in smaller operations so what I want to do I'm going to zoom in a little bit here go across to here all right and explain a couple of things. Now, this is a stereo one, all right? Um, so, we're not going to worry about any of 
these lights. I want to look at the settings, okay? So this is the expander or gate. We're not going to worry about that. This is the compressor limiter section that we're talking about here, okay? So you have your threshold. Now, this is where you want the compressor to kick up. And you can see there it's at minus 20 dB. Okay. Now what this means is, is anything over that, it brings it down. Okay. The ratio. How hard a ratio do you want? Do you want, you can see here it's running at a 2 to 1 compression ratio. So for every 2 dB, it's 1 dB. 2 to 1. Okay. We're not going to worry about the low contour. The attack time. How quickly do you want the compressor to grab that signal? Do you want it to grab it really quickly? Or do you want to take a while for it to open up? So 300 milliseconds, which means it takes 300 milliseconds for the compressor to react. Or half a millisecond. It grabs it pretty much straight away. Okay. How quickly do you want it to release it? So, do you want it to attack it and release it at pretty much at the same time so you can really crack down on, on a spike? Or do you want it fairly soft? So that the, you may have a signal going in that's a little high for a while. You want the compressor to try and compress everything down again over a preset amount of time, as you can see. And then your makeup game, right? So, you may have it, you can see here, all right, Forget about the DSR. You have you have your input gain, which you can see here is at plus nine. All right, so it's it it it's at plus nine dB going in, and you can see here that they're reducing it down to, for example, minus twenty four dB. Okay, so you may need you may want to bring it back up. Um. A little bit because the the level may have gone down too far where it's got too quiet and the rest of your audio is washing out everything else so you need to bring it back up so you bring up your makeup gain okay so you can see here right you may have it at minus 24 gain reduction so that they're not driving it hard all right and the output gain might be at minus 12. And all the other signals over the top of it are washing it out. So you need to bring it up back closer to maybe minus three. So you use the um, makeup gain to bring everything back up again, okay? That's generally the simplistic way of looking at a compressor, all right? Now, it works in the same way as a DAW compressor, which when we have a look at DAWs, I'll show you, okay? So it works in a similar vein. Noise gate. Now, I couldn't find a good picture with this, all right? Which means it's a little blurry, but you can see here, um, the, these are the three settings we'll look at. So the trigger, how loud the sound has to be to get through the gate, how long you want the gate to stay open, and how quickly you want the gate to shut again. Okay? So I'm not going to worry about the rest of these at the moment because we can't see them, but this is it here, expand a gate. So... Where does the, where, where, what, what decibel setting does the gate trigger and open? All right. How long does the gate stay open for? And how quickly does the gate then shut? So say, to use that same analogy I mentioned earlier, you may have some Atmos mics in the live space. And when the drummer you know, goes hard, you may want those Atmos mics to stay open for a while, right? You may have it set to trigger the Atmos mics at minus 10, and you want it to stay open, but the, the, the very second you don't need them, you want that gate to shut pretty quick, okay? So you have your threshold, 
So your DB trigger, how long it stays open, and then how quickly it closes. So how quickly it releases it, basically, all right? That's a noise gate in simplistic terms. The um, TC Electronics M1, my favorite, beloved, used it many times, multi-effects unit with a heap of different types of echoes and reverbs and gated, noise, uh, gated reverbs, um, custom settings where you can create your own reverb system. So basically what you have, um, you have your input level. So you, you can actually set, if you've got a signal at zero dB, you can set how much of that signal comes in and you can see here, they're nearly hitting zero dB FS, all right? This works in FS, all right? So you've got, you know, minus uh, 15, 12, 9, uh, 3, 0, I think that is. Sorry, 12, 6, 3, 0. Okay, so that's your input level, relative input level. How much of the mix do you want? Now, what that means is a fully dry effect means there's no you're not going to hear that reverb or echo if you go to fully mixed it means you hear almost none of the dry signal and all the wet sound which is the entire echo reverb gated reverb what have you <coughs> and then the balance of it okay you display now you can see here this is the m1 hall i've used this effect i'm not i don't like it as much but it's it's nice you can modify these effects. You can see here that uh, they've edited it. It's a MIDI in control. Um, the whole effect's all right. It's, it's not not one that I would use. Um, I've actually used, I think it's the, I can't remember the name of the effect now. It's terrible. It's been a while since I've used the name one. But I think for memory, it is the, well, there's the Studio A effect. It, it's a, re, it's a, it's essentially what I called it was the 80s big sound reverb, all right? And I put it over a set of drums to really make those drums sound 80s type big. Um, one of the drum machines, it's either Roland or Lindrum. And I mean, I've done so much pro audio stuff and synth stuff over the years, I forget a lot of it, but the effect in this was basically, it's a massive reverb, it's a drum reverb, basically, and it really brings the drums, makes them sound really big. Um, I love this unit. And there's many other effects units out there. There's Spring Echo units, Yamaha have got an effects unit as well, so does JBL. Um... These are your effects, so your bypasses, your edit points, so you might edit one of the hall effects to try and change the dynamic of the effect. Um, your IO, your routing, you may do a tap setup as well. And then you've got your up and down controls and your recall for some of your custom settings. And most effects units will have those, that capability in it, all right? So, they're just some of what you need, all right? Not all of what you need, but some of what you need in a recording studio, okay? Along with various other stuff. Now, in part two of this effects and dynamics, uh, part of our simple tutorial, we're gonna talk about EQ because that's both, I, I look at EQ because it adds an effect, so bass, treble, what have you, but it's also acts as dynamics too, because it changes both from a, a, a an external graphic EQ, remembering that the stand, if your ears are in good nick, I say if your ears are in good nick, the full range of the human ear, as we all know, is 20 hertz at the low end to 20 kilohertz at the upper end. That is what you call that is what you call the full human ear range. Okay. 20 to 20. 
right? Now, there are graphic EQs that will do that. And I'll show you an example of a full range graphic EQ. And then you have parametric EQ, which is a little different, okay? But all encompass the whole effects and dynamics in a recording studio, okay? There are a myriad of other things, but if you're talking about getting yourself off the ground, these are things you've just got to have as part of your setup, okay? Now, I did get an email from a viewer. I don't have my phone with me at the moment wanting to know about microphones. We'll get into microphones in a later video because there are so many different microphones, omnidirectional, unidirectional, figure eight, condenser, um, passive, active, passive, active, um, dynamic, Phantom Power, um, Neumann, Shaw, AKG, RCA. Um, you know, there's so many, like cardioid. Um, that there's a myriad of microphones. Um, there's ribbon mics, plate mics. Um, you know, all sorts of different types of microphones, and that's. That's going to be a big video, a very big video. Um, those who know me personally, um, so like MV5 and that, when it comes, I'll, I'll let you in a little secret just before we finish this part of the effects and dynamics. When it comes to a microphone for vocals, so recording a group. Um, and it doesn't matter whether the group is recording in a live space as one unit or you've got the band in the live space and the lead vocalist in a Vox booth. There is only one microphone to this day I will use on vocals, and I have done in the past. Neumann. Need I say anything else? I have found in the past Neumann mics, it's like the U87 and stuff like that. I think that's what, it, actually, I'll tell you what, before we finish this up, just let me bring up for you my favorite vocal microphone, my preferred favorite microphone for lead vocals in a recording studio, the famous U87 from Neumann, okay? But there's many others. All right, so we are going to get into microphones um, in a later video as well, um, just for those, because I have had people ask, email, you know, what's happening with microphones, patch bays, stuff like that. Because when you think about it, and I'm doing a lot of this from a studio point of view anyway, because that's where the vast majority of my experience has been, um, there's a heap that, whoops, I've just knocked my coffee mug. There's a heap of things to cover, all right? Um, which is why in some of this simple tutorial series on Pro Audio, we are breaking topics into multiple parts because otherwise the videos just get way too long. So in part two of Effects and Dynamics, we will look at EQs, the type of EQs used, what they do. What I will say though, and look, th th this is straight up default. We are all familiar with graphic equalizers. Okay, all familiar. You have graphic EQs, you have shelving EQs, and one type of EQ that is very common in any form of recording studio, be it an, a piece of outboard gear or DAW gear, is the parametric EQ. All right, we're gonna get into that. I've got something stuck in my eye, sorry. We're gonna get into that in a later video, all right? In part two of Effects and Dynamics, all right? So there we go. Simple tutorial on Pro Audio. That's it for Monday. Uh, I will catch you hopefully tomorrow, if not Wednesday. Have a good one.